This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to wish listeners from coast to coast in all 50 states a very happy holiday season, especially members of our armed services who are joining us from around the world today. Thank you for your many emails, letters, and cards, and for catapulting the Costa Report to the fastest-growing independent news program in the country. Uh, We cannot thank you enough for your support this past year. And as we approach the end of 2016, it's a good time to reflect on who we are and where we are headed. And I can think of no better person to put those questions into perspective than astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. He'll be joining us in just a moment to help us understand just how unique and also vulnerable the human species is relative to what we've discovered about the universe that surrounds us. But before Mr. Tyson joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Neil deGrasse Tyson was born in Manhattan, New York. He found his calling at the age of nine when he visited the Hayden Planetarium, a visit that led him to pursue a bachelor's degree in physics from Harvard University, a master's in astronomy from the University of Texas, and a doctorate in astrophysics from Columbia University. In 1994, he became a research scientist at Princeton University and also joined the Hayden Planetarium as a staff scientist, and two years later... Tyson became director of the very planetarium that inspired him as a young boy. Mr. Tyson has published numerous books aimed at improving our understanding of the universe, and you also recognize him as the host of Nova, Star Talk, and the television series Cosmos, A Space-Time Odyssey, as well as his many appearances on late-night television. Today, he is with us to dispel some of the long-held myths we have had about our place in the universe and explain why space exploration is of vital importance to the United States and the survival of our species. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report astrophysicist, author, and educator, Mr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Tyson. Thanks for having me. That's that's quite a tall order you put in front of me there. (laughs) Well, I (laughs) have to solve all the secrets of the universe. Uh, Uh Yes, you know, you know all the secrets that at least we know to date. And and I think that's the point I want to make is that, you know, what we're learning is constantly changing. And so, you know, it takes a brave man to write a book because, you know, two years from now, people are saying, well, why didn't you include this? Why didn't you include it? Well, we didn't know that. Well, what the, the, <laughs> so the ideal goal is to try to put in a book things of higher shelf life <laughs> and leave for your blog, and leave for your blog things that are changing weekly. So I think that's how you got to do it. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Um, I, I'm an evolutionary biologist by training, so I live with a constant awareness of all the lucky accidents that occurred that allowed humans to climb to the top of the living pyramid here on Earth. So when I think about discovering intelligent life elsewhere, I recognize just how daunting a proposition that really is. So help us put that into proper perspective. What does the Drake equation tell us about finding intelligent life elsewhere? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And the Drake equation occasionally pops up in conversation, and not enough people, I think, fully understand it. And it's very simple, actually. It's a way to organize our knowledge about how we might find life that we would have a conversation with somewhere in the galaxy. And uh, I can give a simplified version of it, which has the complete soul of the full up version. And that would be you start with like the number of stars in the galaxy, in the Milky Way galaxy. And the latest estimates put that at several hundred billion. And that's a huge number. And then you come at it and you say, all right, if we're only ever going to find life on a planet, what fraction of those stars have planets? So you start hacking away at that large number with a series of fractions in sequence. What fraction have planets? What fraction of those stars with planets can sustain life, life as we know it? 
What fraction of those stars that can't sustain life do have life? And what fraction of those that can sustain life and do have life have intelligent life? And you just you hack your way down this, this, this set of fractions, and in the end, you're left with some number. And that would be your best estimate for the total number of civilizations in the galaxy where you could actually have an interstellar uh, conversation with. And what is that number? <laughs> I knew you would ask that. <laughs> so the very latest estimates, which in, in, a, in a very recent book that I published with two colleagues, we have the most updated estimate for that number. And it comes out between one and 200 civilizations in the galaxy where today you can have a conversation with them. And that, that's, you know, it's, it's small compared to billions, but it's not zero. And that should give us sort of renewed hope that perhaps we're not alone in the galaxy, certainly not the universe. But many more that we might find single-celled organisms or other lower forms of life. Yes, yeah, that's, uh, well, <laughs> dare I accuse you of placing judgment on what is high and what is low life? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as an evolutionary biologist, I, I think we're still a lower intelligent life form. Exactly. So unfortunately, so I, I, I don't consider us an intelligent life form in, to begin with, right? <laughs> Yeah, so I stopped using lower and higher long ago, and I just say complex or less complex. <laughs> there right? you go. And so a worm, a worm is definitely less complex than, than humans. So, so you are absolutely right. It, given the history of life on Earth, where we've been uh, uh, billions of years, we've gone with uh, single-celled organisms leading up basically to the Cambrian explosion of life a half a billion years ago, where life kind of got started getting interesting with limbs and and locomotion and, and, and this sort of thing. So if, if life on Earth is any indication, the trajectory of life on Earth is any indication of what we might find elsewhere, then most planets that do have life, it would just be simple life because complex life happens so late in the evolutionary timetable. Yes, yes. Now, thanks to genomic research, we now know that humans have, a, let's say, roughly a 3% difference in genetic material from our nearest ancestor, the bonobo monkey. But look at what we've been, been able to accomplish with just a 3% genetic difference. I mean, it isn't that hard to imagine intelligent life who might think of humans the way we think of bonobos. Yeah, I think about that all the time. So that, in fact, this 3%, in fact, I'm surprised to learn it's even that large, um, but all that matters is it's a triflingly small relative to how different it could be. Yet, as you said, you know, we have poetry and the Hubble telescope and symphonies and art and science and, and, and comedians. And <laughs> we have all manner of expressions of intelligence in our, uh, in our species. And so you say, well, so what a difference that few percent make. And okay, fine. But maybe that difference is not as great as it sounds. Um, so in other words, maybe the difference in intelligence between the, um, the chimps and humans is as small, is actually as small as that 3% indicates. And maybe the difference between putting a, a stick in a termite mound and retrieving termites to eat is not all that different from the Hubble telescope. And it might sound hard to, to, to think about on those terms, but imagine a species, uh, some alien species, that's 3% farther along on the intelligence scale uh, beyond us in just the same way that we are beyond chimps. If right, and in, 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 in found... many ways they'd be trying to communicate to termites. I mean, we're not making a big it's... effort to talk to termites. Exactly. Why would and they so, even be interested? People ask me, well, why aren't they contacting us? And I'm saying, well, I don't know. I don't see a big effort to talk to bugs. Right, right. And we may just be so stupid compared to their in intellect that we're just not even worth their time. Or maybe we're so stupid they cannot figure out how to communicate <laughs> with us. I mean, <laughs> has anyone had a meaningful conversation with a chimpanzee? I, I don't think so. And that's only a 3% difference. So how could... So their simplest thoughts might be incapable of being transmitted to our feeble brains. Yeah, well, there you go. And that certainly puts that in perspective. We have to take our first break, but stay where you are. We'll be right back with more from Neil deGrasse Tyson. You're listening to the Costa Report.
I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars, recent winners of the best sparkling wine in the U.S. in the Champagne and Sparkling Wine World Championship. Congratulations, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. So what is it about your Brut Cuvée that beat all the other competitors around the world? We really focus on creating an expression of the Santa Lucia Highlands and doing it the right way. And when you control the process from the beginning to the end and you have talent like Michelle and top tier grapes, they really shine through. This was a worldwide competition. It was definitely a humbling experience. We were in a room with producers that have been making wine for over 100, 200 years and was a huge honor to have Tom Stevenson give us the best U.S. Sparkling Wine Award. We fared really well overall. We had three wines win best of class, which was great. Visit the Caraccioli Tasting Room on Dolores Street in Carmel by the Sea or find us online at caracciolicellars.com or reach us by phone 831-622-7722. Hi there, I'm Bob Eubanks. You know, as part of Hollywood for a long time, I've seen my fair share of celebrities get in trouble with the IRS. Well, there's one name I trust, the Tax Defense Group. They're the most trusted name in tax. So if you owe more than $10,000 to the IRS, you really need to call my friends at the Tax Defense Group. Ignoring the IRS is not the solution. They can garnish your paycheck, levy your bank accounts, seize your home or business. But the Tax Defense Group could put a stop to all of that and tailor a program that would reduce your tax debt to pennies on the dollar. you got to love that. So don't just take my word for it. Call them. Find out for yourself. They offer a 100% satisfaction guarantee. And they're open 24 hours a day because they know that tax debt doesn't sleep either. Call now for your free and confidential tax analysis from the most trusted name in tax. Call 800-261-8109. 800-261-8109. Once again, the turning of the seasons finds us tasked with holiday shopping. But shopping for made in China gifts at the big box store brings to mind Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said, It is a cold, lifeless business when you go to the shops to buy something which does not represent your life and talent. Here is a very simple way to buy gifts that do represent your life and talent. Shop the stores that display the Think Local First logo. Think Local First businesses are owned by your friends and neighbors right here in Santa Cruz County. When you buy gifts from Think Local First merchants, more of the money you spend will stay right here in the county so you can spend it again and again and again. Furthermore, the gifts you give from Think Local First merchants are really the gifts of community, your community. December is Shop Local Month in Santa Cruz County. Shop for gifts that represent your life and talent. Shop the stores that display the Think Local First logo. Thank you. Hello, Dave Michaels here, SEMD with Longevity. Now, I know you probably have a lot of questions about Longevity. I'm going to give you a number that I want you to call. That number is 831-218-5726. That's 831-218-5726. I want you to call that number, leave a message, and we'll get back to you with the answer. Whether it's about the Healthy Start Pack, Beyond Tangy Tangerine, becoming a CEO, or finding a distributor in your area. 831-218-5726. That's 831-218-5726. Feel free to leave a text as well, 831-218-5726. If you have any questions about Longevity, give that number a call, leave a brief message, and we will get back to you with the answer. If you want to place an order, call that number. If you want to become a distributor, call that number. If you want to become a CEO, call that number, 831 218-5726. Two one eight five seven two six. Dave Michaels, SEMD with Longevity. Thank you. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is popular astrophysicist Mr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. And before the break. We were talking about the spectrum of intelligence and also the real odds of discovering intelligent life elsewhere. Now, just to put into perspective how little we know about our place in space, dark matter and dark energy comprise about 95% of what drives the universe. But we don't really understand what it's made of or how it works. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So everything we do understand, the universe, all of our laws of physics, chemistry, biology, 
all is contained within 5% of what is driving the universe. So if we, we, may, we find ourselves in the unique, possibly unique position of being able to quantify our ignorance <laughs> about how the world works. So as we venture further and further into space and we make discoveries such as gravitational waves, which were predicted by Einstein over a century ago, uh, have we made any new discoveries that fly in the face of the the 5% of the physical universe laws that we do understand? So it, that's a common misconception about how emergent scientific truths work. Mm -hmm. So what happens is if you make a discovery and you have experimental evidence verifying it, and you have multiple verification of that verification, then it becomes a new understanding of how the universe works. Later on, you're not going to find a discovery that undoes what you just confirmed. What can happen, and often does happen, is you find a bigger, deeper understanding of how things work that encloses what you've already determined to be true. This is what happened in the transition from going from Newton's equations of motion and gravity to Einstein's equations of motion and gravity. It's been caricatured by people saying, oh, Newton out, Einstein in. That's not quite right. If you look at Einstein's equations that deal with severely high gravity and, and very fast speeds and high accelerations, these are things that Newton's equations could not accommodate. But if you put low speeds and low gravities into Newton's equations, they become Einstein into Einstein's equations. They become Newton's equations. So Newton is a subset of the deeper understanding that Einstein brought us. So that, now there are plenty of ideas on the frontier that get tested daily, and we have to throw things out all the time. The, the trash bin of wrong ideas is huge, but once it comes in, we know there's this thing what we call dark matter that's out there. We don't understand it. We don't know what it is, but it has an influence on all kinds of the rest of what's going on in the universe. And that's what we're trying to understand. So it will likely, as we discover more about dark matter, dark energy, it will likely encompass the uh, physics theories, what we, our knowledge about the physical universe uh, as a subset. It, it will include what we already know. Uh, correct, correct. And the same is true with the origin of the universe. The Big Bang is the most successful idea ever put forth for understanding the origin of the universe, where we were small and hot uh, and had a birth nearly 14 billion years ago. And you can say, well, that's weird. I don't, well, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to us uh, because so much of what is discovered falls outside of the access that your senses have to natural phenomena. So don't be surprised if somebody says something that doesn't make sense. That's not the measure of whether something is true. The measure is, is it consistent with observations and experiments that are conducted? If there is a new idea for the origin of the universe that emerges in the future, it's going to somehow contain everything we've described about this origin. It could be a multiverse where there are multiple bubbles popping in and out of existence. There could be something where there's a much bigger bubble than ours, and we're just a tiny piece of that larger bubble, but it's not going to throw away what has been experimentally verified as true. And that's a very good point. It, it, what we learn will not negate, it will encompass. Correct, correct, hmm. provided that what we knew before was, was, was fully supported by observations. There are many occasions where one person makes one experiment and gets one result that flies in the face of everything, and then... People say, oh, my gosh, we all have to go back to the drawing board. Well, just pause, <laughs> you know, <laughs> wait. <or, laughs> the press runs to that frontier, understandably. But it's not an emergent scientific truth until it's verified. And that's, that's how we weed out the, the, the um, crazy things that are true from crazy things that are false. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I, don't, I can't uh, take this this uh, sidebar, but I have to say there is so much more junk science in the world today than I've ever seen. <laughs> so from, from that standpoint, uh, we have to really move much slower than people uh, expect. Uh, and maybe the media needs to not report and have everybody make an abrupt U-turn uh, every time uh, somebody announces something until it's been fully vetted. Now, uh, I, this, I, is, I, this is partly... Oh, yeah. This is partly now, this is, why we I mean, this is very launch. important. Yeah, this is a very important point. And, and sometimes the media reports things so inaccurately and so prematurely 
that I think it does a great right. public disservice. Right. And we're we all wanted the best for our health, for example. And that's why we went through that stretch of time where, oh, cholesterol's good for you. Oh, no, cholesterol's bad for you. No, it's good for you this week. You know? well, well, it means there's something that's being researched in that moment. And the emergence of a, sci of a consensus scientific truth has not arrived yet. And so we all, we're, these, we're these ball bouncing around in a pinball machine, if anybody remembers what that is, uh, until there's a settling of the research frontier. Now, I wasn't so worried about the, the reversals on cholesterol as I was on drinking red wine. They kept going back and forth on whether red wine was good for you, and I was keeping close track of that myself. Uh, naturalist yeah, Ed Wilson, you know, you know uh, Ed Wilson from Harvard, uh, he, he recently yeah, sure. wrote mm -hmm. that when we do discover intelligent life elsewhere, uh, that they probably won't be very interested in our science since presumably science will be similar throughout the universe, but that they will be very interested in the things that make us uniquely human. Uh, we talked about those a little earlier, music, art, social systems, and so on. I, I presume you agree with that. I agree entirely with that. In fact, I think there's not enough celebration of what it is that makes us human. We think uh, you know, look at the, 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 the challenges that the funding of art uh, is up against, you know, and perennially, whereas art is something basically uniquely human. You can get a chimp to do something. I'm told an elephant, you know, has a painting with its, with its trunk. But basically, art as we have come to embrace it and love it and architecture, these are things that are human. And I, I agree. And in alien species, they want to understand us. You don't, you don't look at the science we've discovered. You look at the art that we've created. Yeah, presumably they'll have similar science. So, you know, it's no big deal. Mathematics and science are, are going to be universal, whereas being a human being and how we've evolved and how we approach things will be very, very unique. Um, now, much of what well, they makes might, us... They might, they might chastise us. They might chastise us for saying, how come you guys didn't figure that out yet? We figured that out 100 <laughs> years ago, 1,000 years ago. So there could be a one-upsmanship on who's got the best... Uh, science uh, discoveries, but otherwise you're right. I fully agree with what you're well, saying. Well, I, I do think, you know, we will uh, have explanations that we are not able to put together today uh, I because, you know, science is not just the discovery. It's also the connecting of dots, which, of course, you do so well for the public. And we have to take another commercial break, but stay tuned. We'll be right back after these important messages with Neil deGrasse Tyson. You're listening to The Costa Report. Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. Dole has a bounty of berries ripe for the picking. Fresh berries are not only delicious, but some of the most powerful disease-fighting foods available. Researchers have found that berries have some of the highest antioxidant levels of any fresh fruits. So add a handful or two of your favorite berries to your next meal and enjoy their nutritional benefits and natural sweetness in all of your dishes, from salads to desserts and everything in between. For fresh tips and ideas from Dole's berry experts, visit berries.dole.com. And be sure to check out the pages of mouth-watering recipes. Whether it's a sweet and savory blueberry cranberry chicken salad or a simple strawberry sorbet, Dole has the perfect berry to inspire your next berry licious dish. Put a little light in your home and make your family happy. Hi, I'm George Stagy from the Santa Cruz Lions, inviting you to come to the Santa Cruz Lions tree lot Evergreen Street at the Portuguese Hall parking lot near Costco and pick up your Christmas tree that is guaranteed to light up your family's holiday season. All proceeds benefit hearing, visual, and youth. That's Lions Christmas Trees, Evergreen Street near Costco. Thanks for your support. 
Is your internet connection slow? Etheric Networks can help you. Etheric Networks is the Bay Area's locally owned alternative to DSL satellite and cable. We do a few things to make our service better. We have a great reputation and our staff is committed to providing a great user experience. We listen to our customers and listen to our staff. We pay living wages. Our staff are local Bay Area engineers and professionals. We provide flexibility and personalized service. Being in Silicon Valley, we have direct contact with the networking software and hardware companies and can bring new technologies to market before the cable and phone companies. We operate a tower-based fixed wireless network as well as a fiber optic backbone network that rings the bay. The combination creates an ultra-reliable high-capacity network that you ought to try. KSCO Business Special. Business service up to 10 megabits per second symmetric for as little as $299 a month with a $399 installation fee. Etheric Networks. Call 650-399-4200. Etheric.net. How did it happen again? Well, I was driving down the freeway on my way to work watching this old Betty Grable movie. Watching and, uh, an old Betty Grable movie? Yeah, on a little portable TV. I had it sitting up there in the dashboard. I know. All but of a you sudden, this commercial comes on. The guy in a white coat says, Now watch this amazing demonstration. And? I watched. Next thing I knew, pow! Look, you can't watch television commercials while you commute. I found that out. You yeah. can't read a newspaper. No. The only thing you could do while you're driving is listen to the radio. Yeah, well, that's all I intend to do, boy, just as soon as I get out of traction. Who listens to radio? No matter if it's summer, winter, spring, or fall. Who listens to radio? Only 150 million people. How many lawyers does it take to answer a legal question? In this case, the answer is two. Join my co-host, law professor Stephen Wagner and me, Mitchell Winnick, Dean of Monterey College of Law. Wagner and Winnick on the Law, Saturday afternoons, 4 to 5 p.m., here on KSCO AM 1080. Remember, if you don't know the law, know a lawyer. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, our guest today is Mr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, and we are talking about our place in the universe. Now, Mr. Tyson, you're known as a consummate educator, not only because of your work at the Hayden Planetarium, but because of all the podcasts and television programs you host and public speaking and writing you do. So what's the biggest misconception about the universe the public has? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Just as a preamble to this, I try not to run after people's misconceptions because that's a, that's a that's its own full time job and it's not always successful. What I'd rather do is train people how to think about and analyze information and data from the start, which makes you then less susceptible. It becomes a kind of an inoculation against um, thinking the fuzzy thinking that has. Uh, I think, undermined the science literacy of a nation, which can also manifest in not being able to make informed decisions about legislation, about the future of policy. And so, but I can definitely rank, uh, uh, give you a, a quick ranking here. I would say the most significant is people's uh, um, urge to not want to accept emergent scientific truths if they conflict with your political, cultural, religious uh, uh, sensibilities or, or, or philosophies. And that's just simply not how science worked. And I've said once on, on Bill Maher, I'm happy to repeat it here, that the good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. And, that, and what I mean by true, I'm talking about emergent scientific truths that are experimentally verified. Yes. And again, on the very frontier, stuff comes and goes and stuff can be wrong most of the time. But once you have established it, it is it is there no matter your philosophies. So, of course, there's the denial of human caused climate change. There are people who still want to think that the stars and their positions among the planets in the sky affect your your life and 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 you will 
fold that into your financial decisions and your and your 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 interpersonal decisions. There are people who are certain that the more you dilute a liquid uh, from some potent serum that was in it, the more you dilute it, the more potent the effect of the serum is. These are people who don't understand basic fundamental elements of how and why science works. And it's, it's a statement, it's, a, it's an indictment of the nation's educational system, which I think needs an overhaul to protect us from ourselves. Well, I agree with you. That, that in fact, is what my the book that I wrote was about was the mass confusion between unproven beliefs and uh, and and factual information. There seems to be a huge confusion, not not only in, just in the public, but also amongst uh, our leaders, between what is a fact and what is simply an opinion or an assumption that's being made. Um, and that inevitably does lead to irrational public policy. There's no way around it. Yeah, exactly. And so, and, and that's why I don't. Uh, you put your your you know your finger on the point there. I I don't. You won't find me chasing after politicians, arguing with them, or trying to influence members of Congress. That's kind of the opposite, of course, of what lobbyists do. But as an educator, if you got elected, no matter your thoughts, that means there are people who who want you as their representative. So my challenge is not with your elected, duly elected representative. My challenge is with you as a member, as a fellow citizen of the United States, as a member of the electorate. So that once you learn what science is, how and why it works, then you can make informed decisions about who you vote to then represent you. And, and then when they finally create legislation, it's not about denying science. It's about what are your political leanings and what are your other leanings that you have? And that's what a healthy uh, pluralistic democracy should be. We should not be arguing about what science is or is not true. That's, 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 that's the beginning of the end of an informed democracy. Yes, I, I agree with you. Uh, a, an informed democracy is what we certainly should strive for. But these days, uh, I find public policy not to be based on factual data but more on dogma agendas and, uh, you know, political expediency. It's, it's very disconcerting. Yeah, and a dogma can manifest in many ways. Of course, the most famous kinds of dogma are religious dogma, but there's other dogma. There's social dogma, cultural dogma, nationalist dogma, such as what we found in Nazi Germany. There's, uh, and dogma is some idea that you have for what is true that is, you have judged to be unassailable, even in the absence of evidence in support of it. And then you just invoke it on everyone, whether or not every others agree with it or want to be controlled by it. So dogma as, alone is not a problem until dogma ends up in the hands of people with power over others who don't share that same dogma. Sure. And I don't have a problem with people having opinions, dogma, any beliefs uh, that they want to have if there are no facts available. You know, and in many cases, as a scientist, you know, uh, there are things we don't know. There are there is no factual evidence. Fine. Have whatever opinion you want. But in the face of uh, contradictory factual data, you must change your opinion. Well, I'm even softer than that. I I. I... I agree, but let me go one level softer than you. I don't care what you believe, even if what you believe is in the face of completely conflicting evidence. But if what you believe is in the face of conflicting evidence, then you should not be put in the position of power to create legislation on your belief that then affects others whose dependence on actual evidence matters. So you just keep it to yourself and fine. That's, you know, there shouldn't be <laughs> there you go. thought police running around telling you what you should think. No, no. Think whatever you want. But if you, uh, and, and by the way, uh, I, I, this is what allows me to split into three kinds of truths. There's like your, your personal truth. That's like, is Jesus your savior? Fine. Or is Muhammad the last prophet on earth? These are your personal truths. The objective truths are the things that science establishes. Then I added a third truth to that, the political truth, which is the thing that becomes true simply because you repeat it enough times and psychologically you then think it's true. Well, my, my opinion here is that if you're going to create legislation, there's only one of those three truths that should be based on, and that's the objective truth, because that it, it can then objectively apply to everyone, no matter your belief system. And yet we have very few scientists as political leaders. 
Yeah, we and have, by the way, we have I lawyers. Don't... We have lawyers, and yeah. how many lawyers can make a distinction between those three truths? Yeah, I think lawyers as a group tend to be generally smart people. So it, I, I think I don't think that's the issue. The issue is, uh, especially trial law, you 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 breed a community of trained arguers. All right, this is what you do in the courtroom. You argue. You argue your point vociferously. At no point do you say, oh, wow, I never thought about it that way. Okay, I, I'm wrong. You're right. Let's just agree. And you never, how often do you see that? Okay, so here's the problem. When you fold trained arguers into now a partisan system, you have people who like to argue regardless. And now you fold whether they're liberal or conservative or Democrat or Republican or Tea Party. And then it's, it's a recipe for non-convergent governance. So, but my issue here is not whether you have so much scientists as uh, political leaders, which that would be fun if you had at least a few, but as long as you have someone who is responsive to the advice of a scientist when legislation regarding scientifically informed decisions becomes manifest. And but that's you would really think, what I care you about. You would think that the common ground on which those who have opposing beliefs, the, the basic common ground they could come together on is facts, is what the facts are. That, yeah, that should yeah, be and neutral think, ground. The facts are the facts. Should, As you say, they don't exactly. care about opinions. Exactly. And so therein is the problem with our educational system, that we can generate an entire wave of adults in leadership positions that do not understand that. That's it's a serious problem. And I want I, I fear for the future of our our democracy, of our republic, uh, given what consequence that could have because of the importance of scientifically informed issues that lay before us regarding uh, energy and climate and food production and all of these matters. It, it's got to be informed, scientifically informed. Absolutely. And we have to find a common ground based on factual data. We have to take our last break. When we come back, we'll find out why space exploration is vital to U.S. interests. You're listening to the Costa Report. Are you struggling with addiction or alcohol problems? If you're depressed, drinking, and using drugs, you may need help. And the Affordable Care Act guarantees coverage of substance abuse. I knew I could get myself out of this. I just needed some hope and some help. I took the first step to recovery when I made the call. Call the Addiction Hope and Helpline now for a free assessment with someone who cares. Call 800-962-6969. 800 962 I feel like I'm losing control. I'm afraid I'll lose my job or even my family. Call now for hope and help with proven gentle recovery programs. I never thought that I could be somebody who didn't drink and use drugs. I'm in recovery, getting the help I need. Call the Addiction Hope and Helpline now for a free assessment with someone who cares. Call 800-962-6969. 800-962-6969. 800-962-6969. The holiday season is just around the corner, and I want to share one of my favorite tips for being able to avoid that last-minute dash to buy something that screams, I didn't put much thought into this. Now imagine a different scenario this year. Imagine the surprise on your loved one's face when they open the first page of the Watchman's Rattle and see a custom dedication in their name by the author. The best part is it's so easy. Just go to RebeccaCosta.com, do it right now, and click on the book cover and presto. In less than three minutes, you can request the inscription you want. So do it now. Go to RebeccaCosta.com, and this year, give an affordable, thoughtful gift that says, this is for you and only you. That's RebeccaCosta.com. Care from the Heart is a dedicated and professional home health care agency that's been serving families in the Tri-County Monterey Bay area for over 18 years. We help our clients and their families handle health challenges with determination, love, and humor. When you work with Care from the Heart, we provide assistance with the utmost respect. 
Your team will consist of nurses, case managers, and home care specialists who will listen and you will design a flexible program to fit your specific needs, either short-term or long-term. You might need help with medication, personal hygiene, meal preparation, transportation, companionship, household chores, or pet care. We can even help you with the dreaded insurance paperwork. If the time has come when you must step into the role of caregiver for a family member, naturally you'll have questions and concerns. Care from the Heart offers classes that provide specific information and skills you'll need to become the positive and supportive influence your family member deserves. And we protect against caregiver burnout by offering periodic respite care for you. Whatever your individual situation, now or in the future, help is available. For a complimentary consultation, call us at 831-476-8316. We can come to you or you are welcome to visit our office in Santa Cruz near Dominican Hospital. Our website is carefromtheheart.net. Hi, this is Dr. David Biles. I want to thank the listeners of the Perspective Radio Show for keeping Santa Cruz County fluoride-free and spreading the word on Agenda 21, chemtrails, geoengineering, the hazards of flu shots, vaccines, and the benefits of oil pulling and biological dentistry. Listen to me, Dr. David Biles, and the other Perspective host, Tom Quinn, as we air the most influential hour on KSCO, noon to one, every Saturday, 1080 AM, 104.1 FM, and KSCO.com. I'm Rebecca Costa, and our guest today is astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, who has a wonderful new book out titled Welcome to the Universe, which lays out what we know to this point in time about our universe. And I want to tell all of our listeners that I thoroughly enjoyed this book. So if you're looking for a book to curl up in front of the fire with, this is the one. You will enjoy it. Now, Mr. Tyson, we tend to be a planet-centric species concerned mainly with what's going on uh, here on Earth. And more importantly, we tend to be a nation, neighborhood, race, religion, and even a self-centric organism. So what do you say to folks who object to the money spent on space exploration and argue that that money should be spent to make conditions here on Earth better? Yeah, I, you know, I, I fully empathize with that sentiment because the Earth is in the here and now and space is some abstract place above your head. And so, so I, don't, I don't get angry when I hear that. What I try to do is offer them perspectives that they might not have carried with them. For example, let's go back to the cave. So we're all in the cave and someone uh, gets hurt in the cave or something happens and you say, well, let me go out over across the valley and over the ridge of mountains and see if there's something there that could help us. And then people in the cave say, no, no, we've got to solve the problems in the cave first before anyone leaves the cave. <laughs> well, we would view that as completely absurd because beyond the cave is food and, and herbs and, and water supplies. And, and, and so when I look at the universe with its unlimited, with the unlimited access to energy from our sun, to resources in asteroids, to <clears throat> discovery on the scientific frontier, the history of which has always, in the hands of wise leaders, brought benefit to our culture and to our civilization, I, I think it's short-sighted to think of it that way. And then there's a more practical argument, which is innovations in science and technology, we have learned over the centuries, are the engines of tomorrow's growth economies. And so if you can stimulate innovation to to go into space, because that's just a fun place to apply your innovation, the discoveries can have profound effects on our economy and your wealth. The, for example, the first trillionaire is going to be the person who mines asteroids. I can just tell you that right now, where uh, metallic asteroids have plenty of supply of things like gold and platinum and other uh, and, and rare earth elements that are rare on earth because they're rare on earth. They're plentiful in space. So, so you need to step back and ask, what is, what is the larger mission statement here? And plus, an asteroid could come take us out. You kind of want to be able to 
deflect that, you think? You want, you want to know how to do that? Uh, and, and maybe you need to be a two-planet species to uh, protect yourself from going extinct entirely. Well, you also point out that space exploration has had an impact on the cultures of the world in a way that nothing else has. Uh, it became the catalyst for the formation of the EPA and the entire environmental movement. Isn't that right? Yeah, you've you you've done all your homework on this. You don't even well, need me in this you. interview. You can just. <laughs> well, thank you. We try to prepare a little bit. <laughs> oh my gosh! So so uh, so if you look at the 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 modern the, the emergent um, uh, uh, environmental movement that that traces to, for example, the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency and the creation of NOAA, the National. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Both of those occurred in 1970, while we were going to the moon. Uh, the, the Whole Earth Catalog, who's thinking Whole Earth? If you're old enough, you remember that. And it was quite an influential sort of statement on who and what we were. The hippie movement in the 60s was originally just let's get out of the war. And then when we started going to the moon, all of a sudden, concern for planet Earth and Earth as a global system, not simply don't pollute my river or my lake, it's don't pollute the Earth. Earth as a global system became paramount in people's priorities, and it got added to the rest of the very real priorities about a cold war with the Soviet Union and a hot war in Southeast Asia and the civil rights movement trying to come to a head, the emergent women's lib movement. So, so it's interesting how space exploration, where we go to the moon, look back, and discover Earth for the first time, that how that can be a kind of like a firmware upgrade in our sensitivity and awareness to our shared fate on this Earth. So, so, so the exploration of space can affect us in far more in, in fundamental ways that you can't even put a dollar figure on. I agree. I, those initial pictures of our planet that we had never had before, surrounded by darkness, gave us such a sense of finiteness. And for the first time, uh, you know, before that, we were drawing pictures of color-coded continents. You know, I, I think you point that out. The Earth was color-coded continents in social studies class, right? Um, and, and it was the first time that we actually even saw the climate as part of the Earth. Not part of space, yeah. but part, part. It was the first time we started to include climate. And you point out just a couple of years after those photos were released to the public, we suddenly had things like Earth Day. Never had that before. Yeah, the first Earth Day was 1970. It could have had it in 1960, but nobody thought about it. How about 1950 or 1940? Nope, nope. It never occurred to anybody to even think that way. Not only that, DDT was banned over those same years. People like to credit uh, Rachel Carson's book, which was, yes, influential in its day, highlighting the dangers of DDT, but there was no legislation that, was, uh, that came out of that. So, uh, later in the decade, 10 years would go by while we were going to the moon. People say, hey, wait a minute. DDT, I think that's bad. Let's ban it. That happened over the same chunk of years, as well as banning lead in gasoline. So, and the, for, and so, the development uh, of catalytic converters. And the catalytic converter. All of that is like, oh, my gosh. And, and it's, again, it's not like we still didn't have other things to worry about. We were still at war, losing 100 servicemen a week. So it's not like all of a sudden the news opened up, the, the news cycles opened up, and now we can find something else to worry about. This was folded into everything else. So I submit to you that the cosmic perspective brought about by exploration in general, first leaving the cave, but now what is the shore of this new ocean? It is Earth's surface. And the ocean is space itself. And in Welcome to the Universe, we, we give you this introduction starting out with well, trying to baptize you with a cosmic perspective so that you have the mindset to think about all the rest of what we've come to discover in the universe. It is a terrific book because you not only uh, tell us what we've discovered about the universe, but how we discovered it. You actually walk us through the methodology, and uh, I really appreciate it. I, I bought copies for all my kids because uh, they're always uh, asking me, you know, what, what's your fascination with space? And I said, well, because uh, as an evolutionary biologist, that's where we go next. <laughs> <laughs> and I am exactly concerned right. with the survival of our species. <laughs> So, and, uh, and, but you can even 
think of that as a defense program, right? Uh, anytime Absolutely. you not you don't want to die, you spend money. Uh, think of the defense of the species. And by the way, in Welcome to the Universe, just to add a little extra ump there, there yes, it, we take you everywhere in the universe. But so it's yes, it's a mile wide, but it's also a mile deep, so that you can drill in to learn not only what we know, but how we have come to know what we tell you is true about the universe. And that's what we're most proud of. Yes, I'm. I the book is wonderfully written, and uh, congratulations on its success. I'm afraid that is all the time that we have left. But before we say goodbye, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your public service, and I I hope that you'll come back again soon. Thank you, Mr. Tyson. Thank you, thank you. It's great to be on your show. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Neil deGrasse Tyson, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if you missed the full interview with Mr. Tyson or any of our other guests, you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from Apple iTunes, Podbean, our YouTube channel, and also our website at RebeccaCosta.com. Next week, I'm going to be taking the week off to spend the holidays with my family, but you need have no fear. We have a wonderful treat in store, and that is the rebroadcast of one of our favorite interviews of 2016. I think we got more emails on this interview than anything else. The founder of eHarmony, Dr. Neil Clark Warren, is going to be with us. He has a few tips on how many of our listeners can find true, lasting love in the new year, and who doesn't need a little help when it comes to love? Don't miss businessman and love expert Dr. Neil Clark Warren next week, right here on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for another hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. Hi, I'm Rebecca Costa, and I want to tell you about a new sponsor of the Costa Report, Michael Zwirling, the founder of ZBS Radio Associates. Michael, or MZ as he's known, is a self-made millionaire who's operated KSCO AM 1080 in Santa Cruz, California for over 25 years. But what's truly fascinating is that MZ didn't make his fortune in radio or by working for others. He built his wealth by thinking outside the box, and now he wants to share his success with you to help you get out of the rut of working day after day just to pay your bills. In the coming months, you're going to hear tips on this program from MZ and people who have followed his advice. Pay close attention, keep an open mind, and then check out the videos and websites he recommends. There's still opportunity in the land of opportunity. Let MZ show you how easy it is to turn your financial situation around today and do it all on your own terms. Hello? Hi, Grandma. No, Grandma, I can't fix your computer. I'm sorry it's so slow, but I don't know what to do with it. You clicked on what? You better call user-friendly computing, because I can fix any PC, Mac, or laptop. They'll even come to your house and pick it up. But if you bring it to the shop, they'll give you a free $50 diagnostic just for saying you heard their ad on KSCO. No, Grandma. Downloading that free internet software won't save you time or money. Let's face it, most of your computer problems these days start with the user being tricked into clicking on a link that contains a path to computer hell. User-friendly computing will have you back on track fast. User-friendly computing is locally owned at 505 River Street across from Gateway Plaza, or you can give them a call at 831-423-9653. That's 831-423-9653. Serving Northern California for over 65 years, this is KSCO Santa Cruz.